Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, we close out our two-part media special, turning our attention away from those who make the news to those who read it and watch it. It's really important to have a context and, and know the players, you know, and you can't know the players if the media and the papers are not doing the stories. Then we wrap up our one-on-one -on -one interviews with the city councilor who now owns four newspapers and the new editor of the Albuquerque Journal. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Now this week we conclude our two-part assessment of the fourth estate in New Mexico. We're narrowing in and asking journalists and viewers alike what more the news industry can do to better serve communities across the state. We'll hear from a special panel of news consumers, a roundtable that includes an attorney, a black community leader, and a UNM student. In just over 15 minutes, I'll ask this panel how they get their news and how it affects their lives. Then I sit down for a virtual discussion with Adolph Pierre-Louis and Ron Wallace, two black journalists with decades of experience covering New Mexico. In the second half of our show, I ask them both how local media has fared covering African-American communities and issues and how that coverage can be expanded. Plus, we'll show you part two of our interview with Pat Davis, the Albuquerque City Council president who now purchased four local newspapers. In about a half hour, executive producer Jeff Proctor asks Mr. Davis whether he's squeezing out other voices and why readers should trust anything published by an organization with a political insider like himself at the helm. But first, we wrap up our other two-part interview with Albuquerque Journal Executive Editor Patrick Etheridge. Jeff continues the discussion with questions about the journal's new website, a change that has wiped the paper's digital archive of everything published before 2020. Let's talk about the website rollout. I know this is going to be an interesting topic for a lot of folks. Um, we've watched that over the, the course of the past couple of weeks. One consequence of that has been that everything pre-2020 is not available on the site. I will lament that personally because that means all of my work is now stricken from the obelisk. Um, and in addition to that, the, the morgue, the hard copy, the clip archive is not open to the public anymore. I wonder, um, are there any plans to sort of restore this incredibly rich digital and analog um, record of the first draft of history that stretches back more than 100 years in our state? So obviously we've retained that. We, we still have all of that, obviously. Um, when it comes to stories and archives of that nature, we've partnered with newspapers.com, um, which will still have everything from the beginning of time. You can still search through all of our stories that way. Photos, we still have an archive that we can easily pull things up. Um, you know, unfortunately, yeah, the, the ability to just dump everything back into the new website, it just wasn't possible, the bandwidth that it would take. and just some of the details that are really over my head as well, I, I don't understand, but they just said it just wasn't going to be possible. Um, and then we just looked at statistics and we kind of let some numbers drive that. Um, anything over three years old, uh, that's less than 5% of our online traffic. Yeah. So at some point we just had to cut it off. But I, I too lament not having that all at our fingertips because it's, it's really nice for reporters or anyone doing research to do that. But I would encourage anyone who's looking for those old stories to go to newspapers.com and you'll still be able to find it. Gotcha. Um, beyond the challenge that I just mentioned, how do you feel like the rollout's gone so far with the new website? I'm glad you asked. Finally, a, a question that I'm, I'm so excited because I, I think it went really well. Um, I come from the company who actually owns the, the product that we just switched to. Yeah, we, right? Yeah, so I'm familiar, familiar with Town News and specifically Blocks, which is what we call it, and it's a, it's a front-end system for reporters as well. Um, it's really easy to operate. Most important, it doesn't break very often at all. It's very reliable, which is why over 2,000 new sites in the, in the country use it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Blocks, which supports our website, it, supports something like 35, 36% of the news sites in the country right now. So it's reliable, relatively user-friendly. Users can follow the writers that they want to and just see their stuff. You can easily click on just local news or just local sports if that's what you want. But it does a really good job of offering more. Um, you know, there are seven stories that you'll see across the top, whereas the old one, I, I would test it and you can sometimes only see a couple. So if nothing else, it just it gives more options for a reader, I think. 
And it rolled out, the rollout, I thought went fantastic. The staff here, um, I thought did really, really well. Uh, for it being something that they hadn't done before, and I've helped roll this system out at several other papers within the corporation I came from, I told the staff here that I thought it went as smoothly in Albuquerque as anywhere I've ever seen. You know, it created some humorous moments on Twitter, too, where everybody had this sort of mass freak out of, oh, my God, the journal got sold to Lee. Right. And I'm watching my boy Matt Rise. I'm like, hang on. Nope, that's not what happened. So right. that, yeah, was, that was fun to watch along. As he is with all breaking news, Matt was on top of it right away. And yeah. Um, so the item that announced your hire in, that, that ran in the newspaper sort of described a mix of skills. Watchdog journalism, which we've talked about a little bit, and some tech savvy, right? It is, after all, the year of our Lord 2023, um, and we're not just bundling news and tossing it into people's driveways anymore. One of the things that really stuck out for me was a quote from you in that item in which you talked about the Albuquerque Journal is not going to be offering squirrel videos, um, which I read with some delight. Uh, that said, I am a regular consumer of what goes at abqjournal.com. And of course, I noticed the green chili cheeseburger videos and stuff like that. Right. So I, I wonder what is the threshold for you um, in terms of something that you do think serves readers, does drive traffic, and then just straight up clickbait. Where's that line? Right. So as I have learned when I moved uh, within the first few days is that folks in Albuquerque, they don't joke about their chili. Um, I've been asked a lot, am I a red or a green person? And I still don't know. But that seemed worthwhile just from that standpoint. And honestly, also, uh, we, we've got a team of journalists who do need to play with this and expand. And I was so excited to see something like that because it, it's a test. I, I, clickbait has become a bad word. Um, at its heart, what clickbait means is people are clicking on it because it's something that they want to consume. Yep. I don't think that that's bad. We've, we've coined it clickbait and it has a negative connotation, but I, I don't think that that's justified. Thank you, BuzzFeed. <laughs> yeah, but I guess what I would tell you is what will drive what we do is if people are interested in it. And that's the great thing about the digital age is that we can see if this has 10,000 people who read it, then it might be important. Maybe we should do more of it. Yeah. If it has 200 people who read it, maybe it's not as important. And that's what I love about modern journalism is you have those stats right away. So we can, feedback, right? we can tell right away, this is a stinker. Let's not do this again. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the staff at this point, right? Yeah. An awful lot of institutional knowledge and memory has walked out the door just in the last couple of months. And I mean with Karen Moses, Dan Herrera, Elise Kaplan, some of the other reporters, it reminds me a little bit of kind of what happened back in 2013 where there were a lot of folks who'd been there for quite some time. I wonder your thoughts on how important that sort of institutional knowledge and institutional memory are at a newspaper like the Journal. Sure, I think it's important for any newspaper, the Journal especially. Um, you know, Karen was very gracious in that she gave a long running warning to everybody that she was leaving and really did a lot to prepare folks. Did a lot to help me as well. We got to spend quite a bit of time together and still now we're in communication. Um, because this is her baby as well. You know, she, she doesn't just retire and not care about it. So that's been really great. Some of those other, you know, Elise, I had met Elise when I came down and interviewed and was crushed when I heard that she was leaving because I think she's a fantastic journalist. Um, what I'm encouraged about is that that institutional knowledge was here so long that a lot of it has really rubbed off on the team that's still there. Um, you know, Elise really helped Matt become the journalist that he is. And I think that he's carrying on that mission seamlessly. And I think that uh, you have a lot of examples of that in the newsroom and those names that you mentioned are still brought up almost daily because I think that the, the team is really devoted to carrying on that work. And I think that they are capable enough that the loss of that institutional knowledge is really minimized because they're so committed to the craft and carrying it on. What are your staffing goals and plans? What, what can you do? Are, are there gaps that you're already starting to look at, um, kind of making some hires? And then what's your sort of recruiting plan there? Are you looking for experience, young folks? How do you repopulate the earth? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, all jokes aside, we, we, you know, we're currently hiring for a, a night cops reporter because that's one of those pressing things that you just have to have. Indeed. Um, you know, we, we have a national search going on right now for a city editor. Um, 
I have an interim city editor, Gabrielle, who's fantastic, a great journalist, been there for a long time, but she wants to do some other things within our newsroom. So we're going to reach out in that. Beyond that, a, a lot of folks have asked me that, especially my own employees, and I can honestly tell them, I don't know yet what positions that we need to fill because I still haven't got a full grasp on the operations. But I do fully intend to, uh, to bring some new people in. And when I approach that, I want the best journalists, the, the people who are going to help the paper get stronger. Um, that doesn't always mean that they'll agree, with, that, that I'll agree with them, but I don't, you don't want yes man either. You want people who are dedicated to the craft, like, like I feel like I am, but there's more than one way to uh, accomplish that. So I can't tell you exactly what I'm looking for. It's a combination of everything. It's a combination of experience, attitude, willingness to embrace the, the digital era, but also strength in traditional journalism. But at the end of the day, if I had to just measure it with one category, it's do they make us stronger? Do they make us better? Yes, folks, uh, seem unlikely. Patrick, journalists are obstinate, persnickety folks. So as I'm sure you know, as well as I do doing this for quite a long time. Um, I, I want to ask another question. The, the journal has historically, um, at various times in its history, had a really difficult relationship with communities of color. Obviously, you are not responsible for any of that. All of those things predate you. But I'm interested in how much you are aware of that. Um, and if you are starting or in a conversation now about how the newspaper might more consistently serve all New Mexicans. Sure, I am somewhat aware of the issue um, and it's, it's concerning. It's, I would tell you that it's top of mind as I look for new hires. Um, I would love the opportunity to diversify a little bit more. I think that that would be really key to moving forward in the right direction. Other than that, I feel very comfortable with the staff that we have and that they are devoted to, to improving upon that. And I'd like to think that our work will show that in the, the future. I appreciate you answering the question. Um, one of the things we're addressing in this special that we're creating about the, the news ecosystem is ownership. So I'm also interested if you uh, are aware of any conversations or any plans um, in which the Lang family might be talking about selling the newspaper, or if you're confident that readers um, and this community can continue to expect family ownership for the journal. Sure. I'm gonna take a drink before I answer Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I would tell you that um, if I thought there was any threat of the journal being sold in the near future, I would not be sitting here right now. Um, it's something that I asked about. It's something that I talked with Bill Lang and his son Pepper Lang about in great depths. And they are committed to me at this point, but really to the entire state to uh, continue this great mission that their family has been carrying on. And there are no plans and no discussions to step away from that or to sell that, which is one of the main reasons that I am excited about being here and that I am here and moving my family here because a family owned newspaper of this size um, who answers only to its, itself and its community rather than stockholders, I think is a fabulous thing for any journalist to be a part of, but even on a, on a larger scale, it's a fabulous thing for a community and a state to have. And starting to become a bit of a unicorn, right? Nationally, not, not enough of those left, that's for sure. It, it really is. It's mm -hmm. such a rarity that I feel so privileged to be part of that. Uh, my last question is one that I'm asking kind of everybody who's participating in the special that we're making. And I'd like to start by sharing my perspective on this. I've been in this job now for about three months. Um, and a lot of what we do here is news analysis and conversations about the news. And it has become increasingly clear to me that when the journal is doing the thing, it makes the conversations we have at this table and the analysis that we do of what's going on in the state and, and the news, it makes that better, it makes that richer. It's incredibly important in the ecosystem, which is why I asked you to come down here today. But I'm curious your thoughts on that. Where does the journal fit, um, again, a month into this job in the larger ecosystem of news and journalism in the state? Where, where are y'all in the puzzle? Um, you know, I would tell you that I think we're at the forefront. 
I think that um, we, when you work at a smaller newspaper, you're always kind of top of mind of what the Metro is doing. You're always trying to outshine them. I'm in a new position here now where I think that we are the brightest star. I think that we have the best journalists and the most resources to be at the forefront of coverage, possibly determining what the news of the day should be, but we have the resources and we have the dedication to be the driver of journalism in the area. I promise that was my last question, but I'm going to ask you one more right now. Sure. What should we expect in terms of the future of investigative reporting? That is something that I did at the paper and have continued to do in my career. How important is that to you and how do you make it happen? I think it's, it's important because I think the proof is there. You can look at some of the stories that the journal has uncovered, some of the stories that we have done and are continuing to do that have really affected change, that have raised some red flags on things that otherwise maybe wouldn't be changed at all and right now are in the process of being changed because of work that the Albuquerque Journal did. Um, that alone tells me that the work is extremely important. The journalists that are working in that are going to continue to have the resources they need to do that. Patrick, thank you so much for coming. Uh, good luck with the thank future you. and let's check in again a little ways down the road and have another conversation about how things are I look forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. You bet. We need to concentrate on covering the community and the same goes for the African American community. If there is something happening, we, they, that needs coverage because it's not when something bad happens that you show up and you want to cover that community you know if, if it's if there are positive things happening it's as journalists it's our duty to cover that too that discussion with photojournalist adolph pierre louis and publisher ron wallace is coming up in about 40 minutes i also want to thank patrick etheridge for sitting down with us you can watch his entire interview with jeff right now on the pbs video app now it's time to welcome in a very special panel as we continue our deep dive into the state of journalism here in New Mexico. Today, we turn our attention from the bylines of news stories to news consumers. I want to introduce our panelists. I'm very happy to be joined in studio today by Almarina Sosa. She's a student studying political science at the University of New Mexico who also just finished her internship with the State Democratic Party. Welcome to you, uh, to our table. Catherine McGill, you know her, founder and director of the New Mexico Black Leadership Council, and across the table from Kathy is Maureen Sanders. She's an attorney and at Sanders in Westbrook. Thank you all for being here. Now, starting things off, guys, I'm curious to know how each of you catch up with the news. Meaning, do you watch your local news station? Do you have a go-to newspaper or online publication? Kathy, let me start with you. I know it's a very tricky question for you because you've been an online, oh, not online, a news junkie for 30 dang years that I've known you. Yeah. So to ask you what's your go-to is kind of odd, but give us a sense of how you do your news sweep, like say in the morning, what, what does it encompass? I would say like a, a hodgepodge, you know, and we all have these phones now where you can, you know, ask it to tell you the news. And so it tells me, you know, what's going on in the morning and mm -hmm. I listen for as long as I can. And then I read the Washington Post and, you know, you're reading different columns so mm -hmm. I have a, you know, just a, a whole toolkit of, of places that I go to for news. Mm -hmm. um, and then I listen, I read um, for as long as I can. And it, as a percentage, how much is local, how much is national when you start your day? Um, I would say that it's probably 60, 40. Okay local, yeah. national. Yeah, I hear you. Maureen, uh, welcome, it's been a while, good to see you. Uh, I, I'm sure as an attorney, you were a news watcher, certainly. Uh, I'm curious, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you do the thing this way? <laughs> Actually, I, I became a news junkie yeah. um, after I became an attorney, and I was working uh, for Judge Meacham um, at the federal court oh, here sure. in Albuquerque, and I noticed that the Rio Grande Sun was showing up every week, and I said, what is this? And he said, it's the only way I can find out what's going on in northern New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I need to know what's going on in northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he would come in every day, and he ha would have read 
you know, the Albuquerque Journal and the Rio Grande Sun and start talking about it. And I thought, right. okay, he's teaching me something here. And uh, so for my business, it's really important <laughs> to me, at least, to know what's going on. Sure. Um, because it gives context to my cases. Um, okay. I should, I've asked you previously, I apologize, what kind of cases do you work right. on? Just um, so context. historically, most of my cases have been commercial litigation okay. or insurance um, matters. And then I have a great deal of, um, experience in civil rights, gotcha. um, both in federal and, se and state level. All three or four of those things, mm -hmm. you do have to watch the news closely for all Absolutely. of those. Absolutely. Uh, Marina, welcome, and uh, congratulations on what you've accomplished so far. Uh, three cheers for poli -sci students, <laughs> yes, and, <laughs> indeed. Um, I'm curious, uh, you, you know, we have a bit of a generational difference here, certainly not to put you on the spot, but I'm curious how you <laughs> get your news, what's your, what's your news gathering day like as well? Yeah, so I think that it's very much digitalized. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's, it's fair to say for the general sure. population in my in my age range, sure. but I would definitely say that um, it is a mix of local and national um, media coverage, whether that be through apps or just scrolling through social media. Right. I um, try to stay away from that just because I know of all of the the nuances that come with social media. Um, I'm very much aware of that. Um, very well done there, as a poli sci <laughs> student. The nuances of social media, very well done there. <laughs> Thank you. No, but definitely um, mm -hmm. via different apps, I'd say, is how I mainly get my new sources. Do you, uh, Marina, on that point about apps and things, do you feel like you have a relationship with your news organizations? Meaning, if you wanted to, to make something known to your local folks, would you have the, the gumption to actually call somebody and say, I can reach somebody over there and get a story going. I would say so. Yeah. I, I believe that um, it's very important to vocalize your opinions and thoughts, and I think that there are definitely certain channels in which that is able to be done through. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as just ca calling someone and being able to voice your opinion, whether that is through call or email or mm -hmm. just through social media is definitely something that I feel comfortable with and mm -hmm. I think that is very accessible to me and to the general population as Interesting well. Interesting perspective, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I, I do want to go around the table on this next one. More you answer this just a little bit, but I want to get under the skin here a little bit. I, I, I want to know how these news organizations affects your professional lives, uh, folks. Starting, Amori, how did this journalism <coughs> impact or inform if you can, not just your your shop, but the entire legal community, what's the relationship there and why is it important? I think it's important for the legal profession because, you know, for all of our cases, those of us who do litigation, mm -hmm. um, there's a context for it. And so it's important, if I'm going to sue a particular county commission, it's important for me to know that this, this county commission has a long history of doing bad things, um, in my view. Um, and, or is this just a one-off? And so context is really important for the civil litigation side. Unfortunately, I think most of the media focuses on the criminal side, and that, you know, that one, it's not my interest, but right. it also isn't a context situation. It's, you know, it's this particular person um, did this particular crime. Right. And so for those in the civil side of litigation, it's really important to have a context and, and know the players, you know, and you can't know the players right. if the media and the papers are not doing the story. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's an important point about why a newspaper archive is so important. That's it's right. It's not just the daily stuff, but that archive can have so much value right. uh, for research, as you're mentioning more. Right. And I was, you know, I was really saddened to hear that, you know, the journals no longer, archives are not, no longer available right. locally. And, you know, I know that they mentioned newspapers.com and I looked and it costs money to yes. go to newspapers.com. And for me, that's a disservice because I want to be able, I remember a case once where I had this, a stack of this many articles that were relevant to the case. Wow. So during the deposition, I said, here, can you tell me which of the, which quote, if any, in this stack of you, you know, quote by you right. is inaccurate, you know? And so that gave me a way to, to test what the person was saying. Sure, I can see that completely. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent description. Mm -hmm. You know, Kathy, your position is unique, certainly. And I've got to ask, uh, you know, you have a working relationship with the press that you've had for years because yes. of your position at the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. I I'm curious, the feedback loop that you work with, are, are, are you feeling like you're heard? Does your phone calls get picked up? Is there perspective on black issues coming from the other end of the line? with questioning, how does this work when you deal with local press people? You know, I'd say it's a mixed bag. Okay. And 
you know, what we've had to do is knock on the doors and say, we want to partner with you to make sure that you get the stories you need and that you're accurately mm -hmm. depicting what's happening in our community and that you're doing it fairly and equitably. Um, I want to give an example. Just last year, uh, we do a lot of work in the International District, and so we decided that we were doing Pomoja 5K Race for Equity. We had, you know, we brought together residents from the International District, people from outside, from the larger community, and did it right in the heart of the International mm -hmm. District with the symbology of we're literally walking our talk and, you know, we're out here in these streets <laughs> and they belong to us. <laughs> change the narrative um, so that we could see ourselves differently. So I'm pretty good at pitching stories, mm -hmm. sending out news release. We do all the same things um, that, that we always do to get things covered. And nobody was gonna, nobody wanted to do it. We don't have enough people on Sunday. You know, we don't right. have the staff. You know, we, you know, I'm calling saying, who are you sending? Um, and it was really challenging. Adolf, who um, you know and, and, and just uh, interviewed, um, I've known for you know more than three decades, and I know that I could call Adolf and say, Adolf, it's happening again. You know, they're yes. not coming. And on his day off, you know, he came to take a photo mm -hmm. to get placed. And had it not been for that, it would have been, you know, just a sprinkling of coverage, and it was a really, really good thing. Mm -hmm. But the people who decide what a news story is are deciding that it's it's lower priority. Later that day, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about four hours later, there was an incident that involving a shooting down the street from where we were in the neighborhood. It was an isolated incident, I think, um, but but the everybody was out there. Yeah on the same day. And so we wrote about it in, in our own paper that we started because we couldn't get the kind of coverage we need. Right. I, I, that's an interesting story. I, yeah. I, I, can, I can relate to that. You know, El Marina, interestingly, um, the data I'm seeing uh, from Pew Research Center, young people, Gen Z and younger, millennial, younger millennials, not all one big bucket, certainly, consume the most online news, but they also have the lowest polled emotional trust of national news. Would you, would you, does that resonate with you as, as a, in this age cohort as well, that, you know, local stuff's one thing, national news is a whole other thing altogether? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I don't think that I share that same sentiment, but it has been expressed to me via just uh, people in my same age range of that general distrust of the media. I think given the fact that so much of it is, isn't filtered and that it isn't necessarily coming from a place of um, of reliability, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, I think that in general, that that data seems to line up with my general experience mm -hmm. as far as media goes with my age range. Let me, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I, I, again, I'm not asking you to speak for your generation. That's actually a very unfair thing to do, mm -hmm. just you at this table. Yeah. So you're speaking from your heart, and that's interesting. And I'm, I'm just curious, is it important to you to know to you to know how a news organization is funded? Because we talked about that a lot with our two-part series here over the last couple of weeks. That is an important part of this. For yourself, does that mean something to know how they're funded? Yes, it definitely does. And mm -hmm. I think that whenever I am consuming media, I do it in a way that is from a reputable source. And I do put in the effort to put forth the research mm -hmm. as to who is funding and who is guiding whatever um, media coverage that is being put out, so um, I think that that is definitely something that, at least for me, um, resonates with me as far as um, my daily consumption of media, even though um, I think it's important to look at, it, look at media in every different facet that it comes in. Mm -hmm. Good point there, too. Uh, Maureen, uh, like I said, you've dealt with journalists for years, uh, decades, I should say, in that time. You've seen newsrooms shrink. You've seen them vanish altogether. You've seen a lot. What has that meant to, to you in the industry that has changed the relationship with reporters possibly, with these specialized beats like the courthouse stuff? That's a specialized beat. Absolutely. And you have a chance to really get some background or conversations with those kind of reporters. Right. That might be gone now. It is gone and yeah. it's unfortunate. I was 
thinking about it um, as you were talking in terms of, you know, it used to be that Scott Sandlin from the Journal mm -hmm. did the federal court beat. Yes. And so she knew the cases. She was over at that court every day yep. and she would look at every complaint filed. And so she knew which ones um, had a systemic important aspect to it mm -hmm. and she would follow them. And so when she called me about something in a case that's been pending for 30 or 40 years, and I'm not exaggerating, mm -hmm. those are real. Um, she had the background, and so she could say, I just need clarification on what this order means. Right. At the same time, I'm, ha I'm getting a call from somebody regarding the uh, Amat water case that's been pending for 40 years, and they go, my editor just said there was an order. Could you tell me what it was about, and could you give me the history? And I go, no, I'm not going to talk to that person, um, or at least I'll talk to him and answer a question, but I'm not going to give him the background. Right. If it's somebody I know and trust, and they do need some background, I'll say, let's go off the record, yeah. let me give you the background, and then we can go back on the record, and, you know, because I want to help them have the right information, and they're not looking for just a sound bite. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll give them a sound bite at the end, but they have to listen to my lecture there first. You go. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent ending note there. Um, and that is very illustrative of that relationship that can happen mm -hmm. with an industry and reporters when we have the manpower, woman power to take the time and sit down and listen. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's a hard thing to find a time to do that's just sit and listen and learn. Thank you all for coming in to talk with us about this. We value your perspective. We're grateful for your time, certainly. And of course, we want to hear from you all watching, too. Let us know what you think about the current journalism environment here in the state right now on any of our social media pages. Now to part two of Jeff Proctor's interview with Albuquerque City Councilor and newspaper owner Pat Davis. Jeff starts by asking Mr. Davis for a reaction to something he said a few years ago to Alex DeVore. He's the culture editor at the Santa Fe Reporter. So another thing that you talked to Alex about in that 2020 interview when you were making this purchase, yeah. you talked to him about firewalls. Yeah. Um, and I want to read you a quote that you gave him at the time. You said, we're going to take a pass on covering Pat Davis as a key figure. So we're coming up on three years now yeah. since that purchase. You've been on the city council the whole time. You're council president again now. Um, I know you're not running for a third term, right. but what do you say to folks who are suspicious of a newspaper that's owned by a sitting elected official? I think they're right to be, and I want them to be. But I also think you have to look at how we execute that. Carolyn Carlson is a longtime uh, journalist from New Mexico, ran her own newspaper, was in, uh, 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 from the journal, had covered the city and other cities. Carolyn's columns on city council, I don't see till you see it online. Um, and very rarely does she mention me. When she does, it's usually something I said that was stupid and she calls it out. Um, we open our editorial pages. Anybody that wants to yell at me gets published. Um, other folks don't have that privilege, but we go out of our way to do it. Um, but on the rare instances where we do try to cover the, where the editorial team chooses to cover the city, I'll use Tabitha Clay, um, a veteran reporter on crime and criminal justice reform, won statewide award last year for New Mexico Federation of Press Women for her coverage getting police body cameras and reports showing what happened in the 14 minutes of that APD SWAT fire in Southeast, in my district, right? Criticizing the city for doing that. Um, and because we're in litigation, I can't talk about it, can't talk to her about it, still can't. Um, but I think it shows that we're doing good work on the, that they are doing good work on the city um, if you just let journalists do it. And I think the work has to speak for itself. And look, if, if somebody else wanted to do this, I welcome them to do it. Um, I still have not made my money back on this and probably never will, um, but no one else was gonna do this. And so the alternative of let's not have anything versus let's have a thing run by the guy, let's keep a good eye on him, seems like a lot better option to me. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Speaking of your other gig, uh, working in the cannabis industry yeah. now as a consultant, I know the paper has a reporter who is assigned to cover that industry. How does that work? How do you reassure folks about those firewalls you told Alex about three years ago? Yeah, it's, so it's been a little, that's been a little more complicated because a lot of my clients and the folks that we work with to get into the industry want to be featured in a paper, right? Um, we have an advertising uh, group run by uh, Kim Stark, who's fabulous, uh, who takes care of those things. I don't see those dollars, and we actually segment those cannabis dollars into a different account to be sure that it stays away from the normal, uh, the rest of the business operations that if and ever there was a profit I might ever get a check from. Um, but uh, honestly, you know, it's a pretty, again, it's a pretty open policy. If you've got news, we try to cover it, whether you're ours or not. Kim doesn't know who our, our clients are mostly. Um, but again, 
if somebody else did it better, I think the, the industry would jump onto it. But it's the largest cannabis magazine in the state, in part because people who know the industry are giving it a platform um, to be equitable on good, bad, and ugly, whether we're talking about industry trends or industry problems and oversaturation. Let's open the lens a little bit and get into some ecosystem questions. Yeah. And, and as a way to get into that, um, let's talk about what else you're doing in the space right now. We're sort of at a place now where it's, you know, Pat Davis newspaper magnate who nobody ever heard of except for the nerds like me who are yeah. really paying attention. You have since, you bought the paper, you've, you've since bought the Corrales Comment, the Sandoval Signpost, and the Edgewood Independent. Um, newspaper ownership for at least the last 15 years has been a brutal yeah. business um, and a terrible business model, <laughs> frankly. It is. Um, how is it going for you? Are you making money? Do you care to make money? What are, I, you, what are you doing? I, I do care. I would like to make money. Um, but I will say that transition from COP, who could sort of speak both sides in the cannabis conversation about legalization to cannabis consultant, it's, I, I have been very transparent about this. The money that I've been able to make helping other folks help their cannabis business has gone into newspapers, right? So I'm still a city councilor. That's my salary. That's my health care. Um, I put that into that because I think it's important. And, here, and I'll, here's why. Like, I, ne next door is not a good substitute for the Albuquerque Journal City Council column. We talked about this offline. It's not? It, it turns out it's <laughs> not. Uh, it, it, there are some bloggers in town who do like three quarters of a good job of explaining an issue and then kind of go off the rails and get people all distracted about something that's in their agenda. Look, when I'm a city councilor sitting there at midnight in the basement of City Hall, it honestly matters if people understand what we're talking about. And our city is just too big um, to to educate everybody from the dais one-on-one. -on -one. The same goes for a village like Corrales. If if we don't have the Corrales comment for those four or 5,000 households in that, that area, no one's going to cover that. The Albuquerque Journal's not going to put a person there just to cover those issues. Um, and so, like, they lose the opportunity to participate in democracy. Um, and those are the fun papers. Those are the ones that have the cool stories. Those are where the really strange things happen in New Mexico's small towns. So I have this sort of romantic view that if we can just keep those papers alive and at least keep one person going through all those little city council meetings and county commission meetings and school board meetings and just educating people about what's happening in the community, they're more likely to engage, they're more likely to show up, they're more likely to participate. Um, and from that, we'll help everybody else too. Um, the I old informed electorate makes a better decision at the ballot box. A absolutely. Stop. They're going to show up anyway. Mm -hmm. And right now it seems like everybody's voting against something. Mm -hmm. Like, let's at least give them something to try to vote for or at least understand what they're voting about. Um, I think those things are really important. And so the business model goes, hey, all these things are not going to stand alone on their own, clearly. Um, the, the signpost, for example, did a great job. It was a profitable paper when we inherited it. So was the comment. It was doing very well. Um, but it didn't have a long-term strategy. All of these papers, by the way, um, have been print, including the old alibi mostly, uh, have been print with very little digital, had not gotten to the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we've been able to bring, is we're bringing a shared uh, web platform. Everybody uses the same system. Shared email systems, that lowers cost, right? Instead of paying five email bills, you pay sure. one. You pay five web bills, you pay one. We share designers. And so each of them had like a freelance part-time designer because once a week or whenever they put out a paper. Now I have two full-time designers with benefits because How I have enough full -time work. full-time journalists total at those four papers? Full-time journalists, we have six. Uh, we have 14 freelancers um, that regularly contribute and we have another six back-end folks that are full-time, sales, production, et cetera. And they all get benefits and they all get paid really well now um, because we can share their time amongst a bunch of folks. And you're picking up stories from some of the nonprofits I've noticed uh, as well, whether it's Source New Mexico or New Mexico In Depth yeah. or others, those are appearing as well. Um, I wanna ask about media consolidation, right? Yeah. That's been a hot topic since before I was a reporter. Do you think there is some risk in sort of homogenizing the flow of information, whether it's you or someone yeah. else who owns four different newspapers? What do you think the risk is there? And how is the juice worth the squeeze? 
it has to, the, we, we see what Gannett does, right? They come in, they've gotten rid of the newsrooms, and then they, they sell off the nice pieces, and then they sell off the masthead, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to re, uh, we're trying to undo that by putting local people back into these communities, right? We, we hired Glenn Rosales, for example, who has a long history of, of writing for the journal just to cover the Edgewood Independent. Terry Last, T.S. Last from the Journal North, now lives in Sandoval County. He's the editor up there now and for our papers there. We're trying to be sure that we refocus on that and get away from syndication to get away from some of those pieces. Uh, but I will say what you mentioned is, is exactly where I think this model goes. I think it's our job as the local newspaper to cover the local stuff. We're now segmenting out and, and all of those nonprofits like Searchlight are going to cover those in-depth issues. Um, and we'll pick that up and we'll give them readership for their mission and it helps me fill news pages and get more eyes on our issues. So in a 12, 16 page paper, I might have a third of it would be local stuff that we create. A third comes from our partners who do investigative long form stuff. And a third is the classifieds and all those cool things that go, you know, the little widgets that go in the back of the paper. Um, and I think that's gonna be the news cycle for a little while. I'd love to have an investigative reporter in all five papers, but I don't need one if Searchlight is doing its job. And you've got a way to put Searchlight stories in front of people who might not otherwise see them. I'm sort of right. hearing that as part of your model. Uh, I wanna close by talking some, th this is a question I'm gonna be asking everybody for this show that we're making. What is the state of the media ecosystem in New Mexico right now? Are we all completely screwed or does this still matter? It totally matters, and here's how I know it matters. Like I said, when during COVID, when we decided just to give away the news to get eyes on, on readers, we got more than 50,000 email subscribers. That's the second largest email list in the state behind the journal. We influence more people every morning uh, and every Friday when our news comes out in our locals um, than any other newspaper in, group in the state except the journal. That says an awful lot about people who want more news. And I can tell you that looking at the stories they wanna cover, when we watch the data really closely, Everybody clicks the local story first. Everybody clicks the local story, but they spend more eyes on those long form statewide stories. They really, they're longer stories, but they're spending more time with them. What it tells me is there's still a class of folks who really, really care. But unless you live in Corrales or Bernalillo or Edgewood or Moriarty, a lot of our communities don't have that option anymore. And so where do you go, right? It very much folks don't care about what happens in Santa Fe unless they're in session. And it's hard once you lose a reader. So I think we're gonna have to get back to this model of uh, figuring out a, a, a model, and Nick down in Silver City is doing a great job of what's working well, consolidating the back ends. I think we're gonna look for co-ops and opportunities like sharing printing costs and design costs amongst these small papers. Tying the boats together, if you will. Yeah, it's totally gonna do that until we get this right. But I'll tell you now, not every week every paper makes money. Um, and so sometimes one subsidizes the other. And if you care, you're gonna have to pay what used to be $20 a month uh, or $20 a year for your subscription. It's gonna cost 50 or $60 to support local journalism, but I think it matters. So the ecosystem is not just us sitting around talking to each other and about each other. There are people who this still matters for from your perspective. It, there are totally enough people in New Mexico to make this work and there are totally enough people in every town in New Mexico to make this work. It's just how, how big you make it. The independent works, it's 4,000 square miles in four counties, but you put enough of those people together and there are enough eyes. Um, but they have to support it. Um, and you know the idea that you can just get it online on Facebook or free, it, can't forever be our model. Pat Davis, thanks for coming down today. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks, Jeff. I want to welcome in one last special panel as we continue our assessment of the journalism ecosystem here in New Mexico. We know New Mexico has a rich cultural fabric, but narratives like the tri-cultural myth have sometimes meant that stories and voices from the black community get left out. That goes for news as much as anything else. It's something we wanted to talk about with two African-American journalists. We're very happy to be joined virtually today by Adolphe Pierre-Louis, who spent years working as a photojournalist for the Albuquerque Journal, and Ron Wallace, longtime publisher of the Perspective magazine here in New Mexico. Now, guys, we really want to get into how the reporting on black issues locally fares, especially when it comes to policy and decision making. But let me start with some background on each of you and the work that you've done. Photojournalism is a term we sort of take for granted uh, in our collective understanding. Uh, from your perspective, what exactly is photojournalism, in quotes there, to you, and what responsibilities does that carry as a photojournalist? Well, as a photojournalist, my job has always been to uh, tell stories. I use my cameras 
to tell stories about this community. Uh, I've been fortunate to live here for the last uh, 33 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel that um, a lot of time, especially the African-American community here in New Mexico is not represented in the media mm -hmm. in terms of uh, personnel, but also in terms of coverage. And I feel it's very important that um, we cannot claim to be a, a community newspaper if we don't cover a community. Right. I feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. Is what you're saying is a black focused newspaper the way to fill those gaps? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so because it's more targeted toward that community. And I feel that uh, having that kind of coverage is, is very important. Ron, in your years of publishing The Perspective, what have you found that black folks want to read, basically? What's the biggest reason folks pick up the, uh, your, your publication? Well, the reason The Perspective was, was, was uh, so important to the community is because we got the stories that nobody else would cover, that the major networks didn't see as important. Mm -hmm. But they were important for our community uh, to highlight our young people, to highlight the seniors in our community when they mm -hmm. when things are happening. Mm -hmm. And so they might not have been important enough for the all of New Mexico to to get, but it was important that we didn't be we we, we didn't remain invisible. And for our young people to see us and to see the accomplishments, it was important for them to see us all the time, mm -hmm. not just every now and then. Mm -hmm. They needed to see us and know that we were doing things all the time and for their accomplishments to also be valued. And so what I felt the perspective had the opportunity to, to, had, uh, to show the value of our community without having to choose between, oh, goodness, is this story more important than that one? Ron, real quick, you know, you've been a, such a strong voice for years uh, on the importance of showcasing young black achievement. And I want to put, note particularly graduation season. It's, the, it's sort of like the number one pickup of your publication to see who's doing what, where. When it comes, why, why was that important to you to highlight graduation season especially? Uh, for one, it was, it, was, it, was, it was good for the students to have, you know, have their pictures taken and be, be uh, you know, to, to feel important about what they, the accomplishment they just had. And so, yeah, we would go and take pictures of the black student graduates and we contract with APS to, to get them those pictures and, and in a video fashion, because it was important for the students to know that, hey, somebody's very excited about what we did. Mm -hmm. They're very excited about us being able to graduate and to go on to do other, uh, you know, additional things in life. I've always wondered why the local papers don't, didn't look at you and pick up on that because I'm telling you, you want your newspaper picked up, highlight some high school students graduating. You'll get a lot of papers exactly. moved. It's an amazing I thing. Uh, Adolph, let me go back to something serious here uh, in your life, of course, which was in 2011, New Mexico State Police Officer illegally pulled you over, held you at gunpoint, made you uh, sit on your knees with handcuffs behind your back, while traffic was going by on the highway, you were driving a journal vehicle, you were wearing your press credentials while this all happened. Now you settled the case, and years later, of course, and a part of that, the judge ordered that you be allowed to speak to police cadets about that experience. And you've been one of the few very long time black journalists in the state for years. How did that illegal traffic stop inform your experience here? Well, uh, I deal with police all the time. Yeah. Well, I was working for the journal because, you know, I show up at a crime scene, I need to get information. So uh, I have to be able to talk to a PIO or the police chief and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that experience um, hasn't changed my view of police, but it also uh, taught me a valuable les lesson that uh, it's important that officers not only learn how to use discretion, but also they have to do their job, which is to figure out a, a description of a subject before embarking on a chase. And uh, me going up to the academy to talk to those cadets up there has been 
an amazing experience. Mm. Uh, last April, I went up there and uh, I was supposed to be up there for uh, about an hour. I ended up spending almost two and a half hours wow. teaching a class that had uh, 62 cadets in it, the largest class ever. And it's important for me to open that channel of communication between law enforcement and media, but more than that, and the general public in general. Uh, I mean, uh, this is more than just media. Sure. It's, it's a general public. I, I guess um, my uh, view is that I've had several police chiefs since then approach me and thank me hmm. for making all those officers better officers in terms of educating them about unconscious bias, about attention to details, because the gentleman that they were looking for was a five foot, foot two uh, Hispanic oh. guy, bald, wearing black basketball short and a white t-shirt. Right. And that did not match my description whatsoever. Not even and close. All right. Search. And so my, when I, what I teach them is when I go up to Santa Fe at the academy to teach those officers, I tell them, make sure you take notes, make sure you ask the specific questions uh, before taking off and embarking on a chase and you don't even know who you're looking for. Right. You you cannot just go by a make and a color of a car. You have to make sure you ask, well, the subject that I'm looking for, uh, what's his race? How old is he? Um, what is he wearing? Um, does he have any tattoos? Does he have um, any particular sign on his body that I need to be looking for? So all those important details that, in my case, were completely missed. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, uh, and, you know, it, the, what makes it more rewarding is to get the reaction from those cadets up there, from those police officers, when I go up there to talk to them, uh, because they really, really appreciate the job that I've been doing with them, teaching them how to do their job, mm -hmm. basically. Interesting. Got last question for the both of you. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Adolf, for this one. What can black journalists here do better to serve the needs of black New Mexicans? Offer more coverage. Mm -hmm. We live in a community where we have a lot of stories happening. And as a photojournalist, I never want to go down to the South Valley when there is homicide. Right. If there is something positive happening in a community, that's our duty to go out there and cover it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was very fortunate uh, that I started my career at the New York Daily News in New York. And I got to work with Jimmy Breslin. Oh, wow. Mike Lupica. Wow. Bob Hurd. <laughs> and those guys, they were they were personal friends of mine. Mm -hmm. I got to sit down, sit down and talk to them. Jimmy Breslin always tell me, Adolf, you're a young journalist. If you want to really get a story, go on site. Get to smell what was your what your subject is smelling. Get to see what they're seeing. Get to experience what conditions uh, that they're living in, mm -hmm. because that will allow you to tell a better story about what you're trying to inform your readers on. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in itself has always been my motto. Yeah. Good. Coverage, 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 offer more coverage. And I think, um, you know, to me, it's not acceptable that something can be happening right here in Albuquerque. Instead of uh, having the journal cover it, we have AP covering it. Right. I don't think that's, that's possible. That's you know right. what I mean? We are a local newspaper. We need to concentrate on covering the community. And the same goes for the African American community. If there is something happening, we they that needs coverage because it's not when something bad happens that you show up and you want to cover that community you know if, if it's if there are positive things happening it's as journalists it's our duty to cover that too mm -hmm. good points there ron uh same question to you uh, what can we as black journalists what can we we be doing better but also uh tech and online 
the internet. What's, what's your, your sense of that and how that can help in this endeavor? Yeah, Gene, that, that was where we were leading to was getting everything electronically. Right. As well as we, the physical uh, existence when we did the magazines was just so we were documented. Mm -hmm. And so people can keep those. And I got that idea from, <coughs> excuse me, talking to a publisher from Jet Magazine. And they were talking about how the magazine would always, for, for African Americans, they put them on a coffee table, they mm -hmm. keep them as keepsakes. So that was why the publishing of the Perspective magazine was so important. And that was why the presentation we put out was so important. We wanted to make sure there was something people were proud of and that they would keep. And we knew that if we remained paper, uh, that that would go away mm -hmm. but that's why we went to the glossy we went to the magazines and we had several different uh, magazine looks trying to get the one that we wanted our community to make sure our community was proud of the presentation mm -hmm. it's, it's a pr privilege and a blessing to be able to do the things that that we do to tell about our community and and like i said uh, you guys are so important because you have spots that 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 get, you know, you're out there and you're covering uh, our community as well in different venues, mm -hmm. different stations, different things that now everybody's getting it. And so I, it was a pleasure for me to say, hey, I know we're getting them out there with, 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 with the people who are already on TV, Gene, uh, uh, Adolf, Tia, and, and, you know, and those, so it was good to already have a team already out there that were already in position. Mm -hmm. And then I could just focus on the black community and, and, and just pick up the stories that, you know, I need to make sure that we got out there for our community to uh, make the value, make mm -hmm. the feeling of the value, know that, hey, what we're doing is so important. And yes, and what we're doing, we're gonna talk about it. I love it. And it won't get lost. So after all the interviews and perspectives from those inside the fourth estate and those who watch it, what can we conclude about how media and our work is sitting with the community? Now from this seat, it looks rather amazing. When I think on the level of talent displayed over the last two weeks in this studio and via Zoom, it's hard to argue that we may be in some sort of golden era of news coverage in the state currently. I honestly can't think of a time period where we have enjoyed so many passionate, committed reporters on the street and again, when I say the street, I mean statewide. It's rather amazing. But that's me. It's easy to boost and support my press peers from inside this studio, but it's the other end of the camera who gets the last call, isn't it? Now, it's a relationship for all concerned. The convo has to go two ways to get good news coverage. It's foolhardy and non-productive for us to judge ourselves on our value and worth to the news consumer so that feedback loop I'm talking about, that final word from the viewer, the reader, or the listener, is the only word that counts. Yes, we may have it good right now, but things can always get better, but only, only if that feedback loop is timely, vigorous, and productive. Believe it or not, news gathering is somewhat of a team effort, and you're on it. Again, our thanks to all the journalists statewide and those who watch them. Let us know where you think the state of journalism is in New Mexico currently. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.